This is Coach Jason Ballard, and I'm a business wingman. Over the years, I've learned a lot from working in our family construction business, serving as a senior officer in the United States Air Force, and running 12 different organizations around the world. Many, many people helped me get to where I am today, and it's my mission in life to serve as a personal wingman to others. That's what this podcast is all about, providing knowledge, tools, resources and mentorship to help people soar to their highest altitude. Welcome back to the Soar Higher podcast. This is your host, Coach Jason Ballard. It's a real honor to be with you today. We've got another great, great person on this show, an expert in in a field that we can all, all get better at. Um, Today, we have the privilege of having Greg Williams on our show. Um, Before I tell you a little bit more about Greg, Greg's here to talk about something really, really important, the art of negotiation, how to master it and really get the things you really want in life the way, the right way. And so Greg is an expert. He is a master negotiator and body language expert. He's worked with companies and organizations all over the world, over 19 countries uh, to be exact. He's worked with companies like Mercedes-Benz, Bank of America, Merck Pharmaceuticals, just to name a few. He's also a keynote speaker, a television uh, contributor and personality, been on shows like MSNBC. He's also an author of seven different powerful books a uh, couple of them that are, are certainly bestsellers I wanted to highlight, Negotiating with a Bully and Body Language Secrets, Secrets to Win More Negotiations. Uh, without further ado, I just want to introduce and bring on the show Mr. Greg Williams. Welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate that. And boy, oh boy, after listening to that intro, I thought to myself, hmm, is he talking about me? My gosh, but that, it's all good, as they say. <laughs> well, we can negotiate through that, Greg. That's the purpose of this show, right? So um, you're you're a, a terrific human being, but you certainly got uh, many, many years of experience, wrote the book on this topic of, of the art of negotiation and, you know, just really communicating effectively w- with people. But before we start breaking into, into that, I just tell... Uh, uh, folks, a little bit about you, you know, kind of catch us up on who you are and kind of how you got to where you are today in this uh, world of negotiation. Well, well, you know, thank you for that opportunity, because one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is the fact that they are always negotiating. People go, well, wait a minute, if I'm not sitting across the table from someone and uh, we're not in a business environment, uh, that's not really a negotiation. Well, actually it is because however you position yourself today positions you for opportunities or a lack of tomorrow. And thus you're constantly negotiating. I grew up in a very impoverished environment. I observed my mother and my grandmother negotiate for everything. And unbeknownst to me at that time, I was just observing lessons from them as they would ask someone, can't you do just a little bit better with that price? Or, um, well, I don't know. It sounds like we're getting close to a good deal. Or the one I love that my mother used to do a lot as she was about to hand someone money to conclude whatever sale or whatever was about to occur she would slightly pull it back and go, well, how about uh, if we, and then she would add just a little bit more. I came to learn that as the salami tactic. You get a little bit, you get a little bit, and you get a little bit more, and you end up getting a lot more than you otherwise would have. Throughout the lo- throughout my life then, uh, I started paying more attention as I got older to negotiation tactics and strategies that would allow me to obtain outcomes that were better than other people would get. Do a fast forward. Now, I've been in business for 31 years. Before I started my business, I was a vice president at an organization and my division had the highest margins of all of the divisions within the company. And the president asked me, 
what in the world are you guys doing that no one else is doing? And I said, well, I, I've taught my people how to negotiate. And he asked if I'd do it for the whole company. Do a fast forward past that. Realizing that I had stumbled onto something, I started learning more about what tactics to use, how to put different tactics together to formulate different strategies based on the individuals with whom I was negotiating. Based on also the different types and styles of negotiators, you have the bully type of uh, negotiator from time to time. You have the type of negotiator that will go along to get along. And you treat those two individuals differently in a negotiation than you would treat either. And there may be the complexity of someone that starts off as a bully that modifies their position, someone that starts off as a go along to get along, becoming a tougher individual to deal with. You have to know how to switch up. And those are some of the tactics and strategies I discovered and implemented and then started teaching people more about the negotiation process while reading body language, because that's another aspect that we have to master, as it were, throughout the world. That is awesome. So fascinating story. You don't really think about it, but you're just sitting there witnessing your your mom and your family members and people that you grew up being around just conversing with people. And, you know, it's like, you know, I, I, I guess, you know, I think about it. I used to go to flea markets with my family sometime, like Saturday afternoons, especially in the summer months, right? We go and, you know, my dad owned a construction business and he'd go and be looking for hammers or tools or just, you know, things like that. And you didn't, didn't need to spend a ton of money on them. He just needed to replace a hammer, or, you know, a tape measure, I don't know, whatever. Right. And, you know, you go and, and, you know, flea markets and those kind of things, they're, they're a negotiator's habit. Like, like, you know, yeah, there's the sticker says $5 on you. are like, Hey, would you take three? Well, make it three fifty, and we got a deal. Right. You know, there, you know, you do like a yard sale or neighborhood does that at every, you know, there's certain folks that will come into the neighborhood and they'll go to house to house. Everybody's got their stuff laid out in their driveways and it's this big, annual yard sale, all the stuff you're trying to get rid of. And, and it's just negotiate, you know, everybody's nego. Wow. Yeah. Pair of shoes, 10 bucks, you know, they're normally a hundred dollar pair of shoes. You're giving them away for 10 bucks and they're barely even used. And they're like, yeah, would you take eight? And you're sure. Why not? You know? And it's just fascinating that you kind of picked up on that and learned how they did that. And so, so how did you kind of, how did you learn how to, do, obviously you learned it from your, your family members and being in business, but did you go take classes? Did, were there courses? Like, how did you get to the point where you were like a master and you were telling everybody else how to do this stuff? Well, well, you know, that's also very interesting, Jason, because I'm going to bring in the aspect of body language right into the conversation at this particular point in time. You may have noticed how I somewhat lit up with a broader smile initially when you mentioned flea markets. And the reason mm -hmm. that occurred is because to this day, I still go to flea markets just to test test out different tactics and strategies. It's like you said, it's it's well, gold. like your test lab then, yeah, right? It, it, exactly. Truth. <laughs> I mean, really, <laughs> really, really awesome. so definitely so. And uh, to the point of how did I get to the point of being a master negotiator? I've taken classes, uh, Harvard, as an example, on negotiation. Uh, I was when I was a TV news contributor, I would be called upon just to highlight some of the negotiation tactics and strategies people in the news, celebrities, uh, were actually using and implying, or I should say employing, uh, in different situations, politicians, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I was also asked to comment about their body language. So if by chance some a network contacted me and said, hey, can you be on tonight and talk about XYZ's negotiation strategies? One of the first thing I would do is find out about XYZ's background as far as what they had done. And I would start thinking about what is it that they have done 
to position themselves as such. I say that to say, part of being a good negotiator is making sure that you've done your preparation such that you know the individual with whom you will be either discussing in the case that I'm citing or negotiating with in other positions. You want to gather background information about that individual so that you know exactly how they might react to one particular tactic. Hypothetically, if right now, all of a sudden, did you see your reaction? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. looked up like, wait a minute, what happened? Type yeah, I was taking a note. You brought up a really good point. I was taking a quick note and then you you paused and I'm like, all right, did he fall off the air here? What happened? Right. <laughs> uh, it, right, right. So how might you actually stimulate someone to cause a mood shift or change in them is something that you need to discern before you get to the negotiation table. So psychology obviously goes into that aspect. And those were aspects that I learned in order to become yet a better negotiator. And truth be known, like I said, I've been in business 31 years, written seven books on the topic. So I've done uh, tons of research about the negotiation process. And I've hung around some very, very smart people, even though I shouldn't say even though those from Harvard, as an example, uh, to actually increase my knowledge and expertise about the negotiation process. Plus, I've literally been in thousands of negotiations, sometimes negotiating on behalf of a client, and yet I've seen different aspects of large corporations and how they negotiate obviously different because they have, in a lot of cases, more resources than individuals. So again, there are different shifts and aspects that come about when you're negotiating, number one, such that you understand more about what the other entity might do. And those were some of the skills that I mastered. If I do X, they should do Y. Whoa, if they don't do Y and instead they do Z, well, I'm prepared for that also. Again, part of the preparation to negotiate in any environment. And that's what I mastered. That's incredible. There was, was there a moment where you, you just kind of, it just kind of hit you. You woke up that day and you're like, you know, I'm pretty good at this negotiation stuff. I like it. I'm, I'm gravitating to it. And I, you know, my company asked me to, my company president asked me to teach these other people. Like, was there a moment where you, you just realized like this, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to own this. I'm going to, I, this is, this is me. This is what I'm going to own. And this is what I'm going to do with this and, and go deep into it. Or did it just happen naturally? I mean, how, how did that happen for you? I'm just curious. There were two situations that actually occurred. Okay. One, I ran for political office and I lost the race, but in losing the race, I got a lot of, well, I should say when I was running, I got a lot of TV exposure during the, the campaign. During that time, I also had to learn, wait a minute, different networks are going to try and position me as a candidate in a particular light. Well, how do you sidestep what you don't want to answer and instead deliver what you intend to deliver? So that was somewhat of a learning experience. The other aspect that occurred I was a, profess a professional blackjack player for uh, a oh few years. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> wow, that's perfect. Uh, I, I can see that. <laughs> yes. So uh, you were always playing cat and mouse, as it were, with the house, the casino. Right. And you, you had to know what body language signals and gestures to make also. And it was all part of a negotiation. If you started winning too much, the house would do something to try and throw you off your game, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you'd have to know exactly how to position yourself, again, a negotiation, such that you were able to still stay undercover while appearing to be neutral, not really knowing a whole lot, like, okay, what am I, what should I do now? Uh, hmm. You know, one of those types <laughs> kind of, of playing things. dumb kind of a... Exactly. I got you. Okay. Uh -huh. So I bet the casinos, you know, probably have you marked, right? You know, when this guy comes in, we got to gotta be on our P's and Q's, right? Well, I must say, never, not once, was I ever barred from any casinos. Uh, 
and I made a, well for three years. It was my only source of living, so it it, it was good times for Dag or sure. And I never got caught, as it were. And I don't do it anymore, which is now why I talk about it. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, let's kind of peel back the onion a little bit here. Uh, what a fascinating story. What a fascinating background you have. And, and I, can, I can see it, you know, just in talking with you today and, and learning more about it, I can, I can definitely tell you, you are really excited and passionate about helping people in these areas. And, and my goodness, you know, as a business coach, it works with, you know, different people all over the world and business and career related things and, you know, trying to help them be more successful, you know, communication and negotiation skills are always kind of hitting the forefront, you know, how you react to things or, or not react to things. And, you know, in, 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 like you said, everything's in negotiation and, and most people don't even realize that they get busy being busy in all their daily work tasks, emails, phone calls, meetings, and they, they forget that, right? So um, from your perspective of, you know, an expert out there in, in that work with thousands of people, what are you seeing? What are some of the trends of, of why people are struggling and challenged with negotiating and communicating and, and interacting better? It seems like we're almost like getting worse, uh, certainly here in America, from my opinion. I mean, what are your thoughts? Well, you hit upon some key factors. First of all, some people do not consider themselves to be a good negotiator, however they define that. And when they define themselves in such manner, they feel as though, well, I'm up against, let's say, a larger entity that has more resources. And they start putting themselves into this state of negativity, making mm -hmm. themselves mentally smaller based on the entity that's much larger with the greater resources that they have to negotiate with. Now, here's a mindset shift with or against, because right there, you've you paired into two different directions. If you have the mindset of, well, I'll be negotiating with these folks and therefore it's going to be a win-win as opposed to, well, I'll be negotiating against these people, which sets the mindset in some cases of uh, it's us, it's me against them. And, uh, they win, I lose, or something of that nature. So it goes back to preparation. That's number one. Always remember, anytime you're negotiating with someone, especially if they've reached out to you first, you have some form of perceived value from their perspective. It behooves you to amplify that such that you put your best foot forward when you're actually negotiating with them. I keep talking about preparation. Understand what they really want from you per why they're negotiating with you. Understand what they're going to do if they can't get it from you, the time frame in which they will do so, what wasteful time they will put into an effort to obtain whatever they're seeking from you, because therein lies where you can gain leverage. You have a lot more power than you realize. And even if you think you don't have a lot of power, you're right. So the point is, you can think you have more power than you do. You can think you have less power than you do. The mindset that you take into that negotiation will state that you are right, and you will most likely negotiate from that perspective. Now, Jason, let me ask you a question. What would you say, being a business coach, that the folks that you advise would want to know the most about the negotiation process and even tie it into body language if you choose. Well, I guess- now, Pause for a moment, pause for a moment. I just took control of the whole situation. Did you notice that? Yeah. And, and now here, here, and yes, I will uh, ask you to answer that question in a moment. The point of that quick exercise is the person asking questions in a negotiation is the person that's controlling the negotiation at that mm. moment. Why? Because that person is going to gather more information than they otherwise would have, which allows them to slightly shift their position if need be. So I'm sorry, Jason. Now, please go forward. No, that was great. I, I love that. Uh, very, very tactical move there. I, I, I That was really good. And I thought, you know, I have that conversation quite a bit in the sales arena, right? And I, I've used a similar phrase. Hey, those that ask the most questions when in a in the sales process 
usually, you know, comes out the better winner, right? So if they're talking to you, they're probably talking to some other vendors. So what makes you different? What makes you better? And a lot of times the products or whatever are pretty equal. The price is pretty equal. You know, what what really differentiates, you know, is likability, trust, you know, some of those personal factors. But, but people like to feel a certain way with certain people, right? So those that ask the most, so if you, if you ask the most questions in a very natural conversational manner versus, you know, somebody over here, that's a competitor, that's what are your pain points? And it's very scripted and they're, they're just trying to get, get to a sore spot to try to, you know, okay, dial in on that, sell that, where somebody else is more, you know, long, long-term thinking about the relationship and, and approaches it where they're asking more questions to learn, kind of playing dumb, like you mentioned, and navigating that conversation, then people get to talk more. And most people like to talk uh, about themselves and their company and, you know, those kind of things, right? From, from what I've seen, now you, you correct me if I'm wrong, but those that ask the most questions usually comes out on top uh, some form or fashion. So in business, it depends on the negotiation. You could be negotiating, you know, a supervisor can be negotiating something with an employee, like, you know, what salary they're going to start you off on if you're hiring a new employee or benefits or time off or, you know, whatever. There could be, I've got, I've got a couple of clients right now in the acquisition process. They're uh, one's acquiring another firm and another one's looking to be acquired, right? And that, there's there's dynamics in each of those that that are different, but you're right. If you kind of dissect those three situations I just mentioned, and then you connect the dots where there's some common ground, what I see, and again, please correct me if I'm wrong, what I see, uh, Greg, is the art for which you enter that the preparation you you put into that to understand the other person's uh, perspective and their needs versus yours and are you going in with a win-win you know mindset right you 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 called it uh kind of almost like this equality mindset like oh if you perceive oh this is a big company they're gonna pounce on me with all their lawyers and this is little old me, you're already in the loser's seat, right? You know, potentially. Um, you've put yourself in a position to to potentially be that way. And so those are just some things I'm seeing, you know, in in the various aspects of negotiation. But happy for you to 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 add to that or or challenge me on that. Well, no, 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 no challenge, because you're absolutely right with everything you said. And not only does it go to the mindset, but the preparation aspect, I cannot highlight enough. Because yeah. even if you're negotiating as an employee, let's say, or no, let's use the other scenario where uh, one company wants to be acquired and the, the other wants to acquire that company or some organization. Why do they want to? What's the end goal that both of these entities have in mind? If you understand the why, you know how to better position yourself to reach an amicable negotiation outcome. But if you don't understand that why, you can haphazardly negotiate, be flip-flopping all over the place, and, and actually increase the chances that you will reach some type of, uh, you won't reach um, a successful outcome at all. And, and thus, again, it goes back to not only preparation, but understanding the mindset that's behind the actions that, that the other entity will actually display when they get to the negotiation table. And by the way, you should have multiple plans. I call them detours with mile markers as you negotiate. So, for example, hypothetically, and I'll use easy numbers at this particular point in time, let's say that you are negotiating with someone uh, for something that's uh, only $100,000. And you know, well, hmm, maybe X amount of time into the negotiation, this, that, or the other should have occurred. And let's say you're 25% into the time frame, the timeline in which you thought the negotiation would be progressing. You expect it to go upon a particular path, but all of a sudden something happens and you have to take a detour. 
in your planning process, you should know how to not only take that detour, but at the same time, take that detour and get yourself back on the schedule that you set. So now let's say you're at the halfway point where you thought you'd be in the negotiation. Let's say things are not going well at all. Okay. You do one of two things at that point. Realizing that you're really far behind the schedule that you thought you'd be, you could say something to the other entity along the lines of, this doesn't seem to be going as well as I thought it would. Uh, what's your perspective? Hmm. Well, what do, what do you mean? Well, again, I, I'm perceiving that uh, we, we may be headed for an impasse. What do you think? Well, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be an impasse. How so? Hmm. Now, what you're doing in that situation is to get, you're getting their perspective of not only where you are in the negotiation, but at the same time, their perspective of how to get back on track. Hmm. And let's say you take their input and you adjust the, the um, tactics that you've already developed now. Remember, you have multiple tactics that add to multiple strategies throughout the negotiation. So you've already adopted to their new position based on the mindset that they have shown you they have for how to get back on track. If it behooves you to do so, you get back on track and you progress the negotiation. Let's say you're at the three quarter mark now. So you have mile markers, always set mile markers in negotiations for where you think you'll be at any one point in time in the negotiation. The reason being, if by chance you invest X amount of time in the negotiation and you continue past the point of where you think you will exit the negotiation, you'd be more likely to participate, staying engaged in the negotiation longer than you should have and Study after study after study has shown the longer you stay engaged in a negotiation past the point where it is advantageous for you to do so, the more likely you are to make concessions. Why? Because I've invested so much time and effort in this. Mm. I've got to see an end point. You've placed yourself at a huge disadvantage at that point. Instead, you might actually say, how about if we just uh, call a timeout or how about if we reconvene at another time and uh, see if we can just uh, find a better path towards a more win-win solution for both of us. And again, you're going to get the perspective that the other person or entity has to readjust your strategies and tactics and or say, OK, we'll back away for right now. And sometimes it's good to back away because... Mm -hmm. It can also that can also then be uh, shown or seen or viewed as the takeaway. Remember what I said earlier? I don't know. Were we live when I said something about? Oh yes, my, the tactic my mother used to use when she was about to give somebody the money and right. then pull the money back. Yeah, exactly. So the takeaway is yet another very strong, advantageous ploy that you can employ when you're negotiating. Talk real fast about the individual that might want to um, get a raise or uh, from their boss or something of that nature. And in a situation of that nature, have some throwaways that you want to give uh, some red herrings. Red herrings are things that don't have a whole lot of value to you, but have a lot of perceived value to the entity with whom you're negotiating. OK, so really, you're telling your, your boss or whomever, uh, I'd like to have uh, three additional weeks vacation. Knowing all along, eh, there's a slight chance, if any, that you'll actually get that. Right. Well, if I can't get that three-week vacation, how about uh, if I instead um, uh, get another $10,000, $15,000, uh, et cetera, et cetera? So you always have different strategies. And going back to that last thing I was right. mentioning about the $100,000, knowing you're going in, knowing you'll settle for $75,000, okay? Knowing that you will not settle for 50, knowing that you're between the ranges of 50 and 75, you know, okay, well, I know I may have to walk away if you're between 75 and 100 now because you're looking for the 100,000, knowing you'll settle for 75, you know you're in your sweet spot. Always mm -hmm. bracket your expectations also such that you know where you are in the negotiation. Yeah. 
Yeah. I think that's really, really important. You know, I, I think about that um, for some reason, my, my mind gravitates to buying a car, right? You know, you go in and, and I, I always go in with a strategy, you know, I know it's going to be a fight. They're going to try to get as much money out of me. I'm trying to get, get as much, you know, pay them as, as less uh, as possible. They're trying to get me to pay more as possible. And it's just, back and forth and back and forth. So obviously a lot of factors go into that. If they've only got one car on the lot and I want that one car, they're not going to negotiate. Uh, you know, normally they're not going to negotiate as much. If they got 20 of them out there and they've been sitting there for a few months, then they're a little more likely to, to, to negotiate there with you. But you're right. You know, so I look, I do the homework and, you know, if you're trading in a V, we just bought my uh, 16 year old daughter, a vehicle, right. And we went in and I, I kind of did my homework up front and researched the prices and the models and the features. And, and we dialed right into that. And, and, um, I knew where I, where I needed to be and what I felt was fair and comfortable there in that negotiation. And then there was a point after about the second time, of them, you know, writing a different number down on the piece of paper and having the manager approve it. And like, they're doing me a a big deal. Right. I just walked away. I I told my daughter ahead of time, I was like, look, you don't look surprised if I say, Hey, let's, let's just go get up and, and, uh, think about this some more, maybe look at some other cars or something. And I'm not sure this one may, may work out to our benefit, blah, blah, blah. I said, so if I, if I see that, you just kind of play dumb and go along with me. Cause if you're like, dad, what about the code? And you sit in there and argue with me, then, then you're, you're hurting. And luckily my, my daughter, that, my, that particular daughter, she's, you know, all right. Yeah. Yeah. Let's screw them over. Let's do it. You know? <laughs> and, and it worked. Cause I, I walked out, went down the road we came back, negotiated again, and we, we got to at least where I wanted to be. Um, and they, they, everybody, it was a win-win. It was, it was actually a, a good negotiation, but Greg, a lot of people, I don't know, so they just get impatient or they don't understand the process of negotiation. So maybe break down the process for people, right? You mentioned planning and research and kind of setting the stage and, timelines and milestones, but, but maybe just kind of walk, what are the major components of a negotiation and how do you know where you are in each stage and when to walk, when to, when to keep talking. And cause you were saying, you know, you, this thing goes on and on and on, you know, what do they say? Time kills all deals, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. walk us through that and, and give us some, maybe some examples of some folks you've helped in those spaces. Okay, well, first I'll just highlight what you said as an example. You did your research ahead of time. Uh, That's step one for daggone sure. You knew something about that dealership as a result of doing your research. Step two, you knew what you wanted to get out of that particular situation. Step three, you had your strategy planned and even, and here's something that's extremely important that you said a moment ago. You had another entity involved, in this case, your daughter, with you in the negotiation process. Now, anytime there are multiple people involved in a negotiation, one person, one person should be the lead in Hmm. that negotiation. Because, as you highlighted, you told your daughter ahead of time, don't go, oh, dad, you know, yada, 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 because (laughs) if we walk out, another entity on your side can end up destroying your position if by chance you're doing, oh, damn, but no, I got to have the car. So what's that salesperson doing thinking to him or herself? Uh Uh-huh. I'm going to play to the daughter now. Oh, Dad, you really don't want uh, your daughter not to have this car. I know that's a double negative. You really want your daughter to have this car, don't you, Dad? And then the daughter's going, oh, yeah, Dad, oh, yeah, 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 type of thing. So, again, you have to understand that everyone on your side understands the strategy, understand the fact that they're going to employ a particular tactic at a particular point in time, and even to the point that you walked away. 
So, I mean, you just highlighted all of the steps in the process of a good negotiation. Now, one thing I would add into that as a tactic, and by the way, tactics are little things that you do. Strategies are comprised of the tactics that you will use. The walk away, for example, was part of a tactic and the overall strategy to get the best price for the vehicle that you were actually seeking. So in that particular situation, as you're using a tactic of, well, no, okay, we'll come back. Here's something I am surprised at, in a, especially in a car dealership situation. Most of the times when people walk away from a car dealership, they don't come back. They go somewhere else, yep. get a better price or, or whatever be the case. And that's when the salesperson will usually do everything in their power to keep that person in the showroom for dad yep. sure, because they know, hey, you walk away, you have more of a chance of actually losing the deal altogether. Hey, I'm never coming back to this place or something of that nature. And again, you have this time frame. Again, you bracket your expectations. That's part of the whole process too of knowing what you want, knowing what is acceptable, and knowing the range. Here's something I've told people on many occasions, going back to that $100,000 uh, scenario again. Okay, you're looking for 100,000. And let's say by chance someone says, uh, well, we'll give you 150,000. You go, okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. That yeah. person, that person's that, going that's to a great point. Yeah, pe people will will won't understand what all's connected to that. Exactly, because see, by showing your eagerness of acceptance in that particular situation, you have also conveyed subliminally that you were not expecting that much. And that hmm. person will think to themselves, okay, let me see how I can ratchet this down. So even if you were expecting 100,000 and someone said 150,000, okay, you know good and darn well, okay, you're above what you expected, okay, that's all well and good. You might use a tactic of silence. Hmm. And let the other person, don't, I mean, if you have to sit there, sit there, let the other person say something. Well, are, are are you okay? Yeah, yeah. You said one hundred and fifty thousand. Uh, and the other person is like, uh, yeah. And you use silence again. I've had situations where, on behalf of some clients, I'll just use the hundred thousand, so as we won't uh, use real numbers in the millions. Uh, that have just used that, and all of a sudden someone would go, okay, 175000 And you can play that tune again. 175000 Some people that are not good negotiators negotiate against themselves, and one way to entice them to do so is to not let on that you are leaping inside of yourself because you know you're way over what you expected, and now here's the caveat to that. Know when to stop. Mm. Because, yeah, okay, you got 175000 right now and you're only looking for 100000 You might then say, as a test, depending upon the situation, and each and every negotiation is separate from the last one. Meaning, tactics that work today may or may not work tomorrow do not rely on them because they worked yesterday. That's the point. Mm. Always be attuned to exactly what's going on in the negotiation such that you are aware of the parameters that's shaping the negotiation. So you say, 175,000? Um, well, what else comes with that? Or whatever verbiage, and we can yeah. talk about verbiage in a moment, uh, is appropriate in that situation. Well, what else would you want? Okay, now, the person should have said, what What else are you looking for or what else do you want uh, before they even offered the 150 And from an anchoring position, the anchoring position allows one to set expectations anyway. So by that person saying okay. 150000 they were anchoring the negotiation at that point in time per 
where we will go from here. We'll go up, we'll go down, yada, yada, yada. If I'm only looking for 100,000 and you tell me 150, I know I'm well above where I would go. So that, that person has anchored the negotiation. <sighs> there are mixed opinions on who should anchor first or what, who should actually state a price or something of that nature. My perspective is the one that has the better negotiation skills can let the other individual anchor the situation. What we just spoke of a moment ago with that 150,000, had I instead thought, well, let me just anchor it. And instead I'll ask for 125,000. I could have lost the opportunity to gain hmm. another 25,000 in the scenario that we're speaking of. So if you have good negotiation skills, knowing what the opposition skill level is, and again, you can discover that in your research, you then know, well, hey, okay, I'll let them anchor it first and see where they go. Suppose they say 50,000. Well, you could lay 50. Come on now. I thought we were having a serious negotiation. You've got to do mm -hmm. a lot better than that. So it's about positioning. And even when you're anchoring, know who or whom to let do so first based on the skill set. That's powerful. Greg, that's really, really powerful. Thank you. Do you see people that may not have, you know, the level of skills that you do, do you see them crack under pressure in the negotiation? What, what kind of tips would, could you give to people to prevent them from cracking? And cause it's kind of like this chess game, right? You know, you, you talk, they talk and you're trying to guess what they're doing. You've done your homework, hopefully, and you, you've got a position, you got some expectations, but you know, as you say, maybe things, uh, you know, detour uh, a time or two. And so how do you stay confident? How do you not crack under the pressure? How do you kind of keep that poker face and mentally um, stay strong as you are talking through that? What, what are some tips you can give some people? Because I know a lot of people, they, they negotiate once or twice, like in a car dealership or something, they'll, they'll go back and forth once or twice. And then after that, it starts getting uncomfortable, right? People start putting their foot, well, this is the best we can do. The manager said we can't do this. And, you know, we are throwing in freak. And then they start telling you all the things they're putting in and, and overwhelming you to make you feel like, well, they are giving us all this stuff. Well, it comes with the car anyway. They're not really giving me anything, right? So what are your thoughts there? First of all, to thine self be true. Know who you are in any negotiation. And mm. I look at negotiations as a game. That's to say you have to portray a certain character or characteristic set based on with whom you're negotiating, number one. Understand the value of time. You, you mm. allot a certain time frame for a negotiation. Even if you're negotiating over a long period of time, you know you're going to be negotiating in segments, as it were. I talked about mile markers earlier on. Know where you should be at any point in time in the negotiation. Understand if by chance you use the takeaway, walk away, what reactions might be submitted, emitted by the entity with whom you're negotiating. Also, there's something else that with body language, and I really want to delve into body language a little mm -hmm. bit more, but let's say hypothetically, Jason, you ask, um, well, let's do a quick role play based on a scenario that any one of your clients might be in where they may feel a little intimidated because, oh my gosh, these the other entity has given us this and they're giving us that and yada, yada, yada. Let, let's do a quick role play. Okay. Go for it. So do you want me to like create a situation? Yes, create a, create right. a situation that one of your clients may have, obviously don't want to disclose uh, through the example who the client is or anything. Right, right. I think... Um... And I'm looking at you now. I'm not looking at the camera just for the audience. So the audience yeah. knows what's happening. One that I think people struggle with the most right now is with talent attraction, right? So everybody complains they can't find good people. And so when they do attract somebody and they do start the interview process and onboarding and, and that whole negotiation, right? You know, because our, our economy is such where, 
there's the the scales are you know uh, predominantly tipped toward the employee right people want to work from home now and they everything costs more money we got inflation right so there there's there's this perception at least that the employee the candidate applying for the role has more of advantage so the the employers are trying to do all they can to compete and and steal that top talent right and so that negotiation um people are struggling with that and what to offer when to offer and you know i don't want to upset the person i don't want this to take longer the longer it takes they're interviewing with other people jason excuse me did you notice the recording error message just popped up no okay now it just went off okay you can continue yeah okay time out time out time out i did that intentionally well the message did show up but i i actually wanted to interrupt you just to see where you'd go back to what you would go back to once we started again okay now here's the point though in some environments again negotiations are all about control. Now I'm looking at the camera again. One thing I was doing when I was looking at you is literally observing your body language as you were speaking. One thing I noticed is you look to the right, which is what most people do when they're trying to assume what will occur in the future. And you have to establish someone's baseline for how they use their body language, such you, such yeah. that you know later on when you ask, um, well, can you do 125,000? And you see them look up into the, or look to the right, you know, they're looking into the future to make their assessment. Let's say on the other hand, you say, can you, um, can we go to 125,000? And they look uh, to the uh, left. Most people will do that when they're trying to reflect on something that has happened in the past. In the negotiation, oh. if I saw you do that, I would then, uh, it, based on your response, if you said yes, I would say, okay, well, I appreciate that, Jason, for sure. If by chance you said, well, I'm not sure if we could do that. Knowing that you looked in this example to the left where you're assessing recall, I would then ask, well, how did you do it in the past? Now, how huh. did you do it in the past is what's termed an assumptive question. The assumption being you've done it in the past. I didn't ask. Did you do it in the past? I just skipped right over that one. So it's about the positioning and the way you actually use questions also. By posing that assumptive question, as I said, it's, well, how did you do that in the past? Knowing that you also look to the left. That, that's one aspect of body language hmm. and how, now I'm looking at the camera again, how, that, uh, how you can frame someone's perspective to know where you are in a negotiation and how that other person feels about where they are in the negotiation with you. That's powerful. I haven't really thought about that. I, I, that's the first time I've ever heard of that. Like if you, if you look to the, if you're thinking about things, you know, like somebody will ask me a question and I, it, it's a thought provoking question and I'm, and I'm, I'm like, all right, let me, let me think of some scenarios. Let me think of what's most popular right now. The biggest thing that, that I'm seeing. Right. And I'm thinking, I do look to my right. Cause I'm, I'm thinking through that. I'm processing. Right. And then I'm like, all right, yeah, I, I I think that would be a great topic. And then I come back, lock in with you, right? But that's the first time I've ever heard of if people look to the right, they're looking into the they're thinking about the future. If they're looking towards the left, that tends to lead you towards the past. That's 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 really fascinating to me. And again, now establish the usage that person emits per those gestures. And I say that simply to say, in body language, there's a majority of things that people will do, but there are those outliers that will do the opposite of it. So by establishing hmm. how that person uses their body language before you even enter the negotiation, that then tells you, wait a minute now, this person doesn't look to the right uh, to obtain uh, the future and doesn't look to the left to look at the past. This person does the opposite. And, hmm. and you're, you're talking about body language and uh, how can you assess to what degree somebody's attuned with you. Let's say you said, um, well, Greg, we can do 150,000. And I said, 150,000? Now, did you notice that small gesture of leaning in? Hmm. Okay. That says I'm more interested also. Conversely, 150,000? 
you see, mm. you're leaning away from the offer. And here's something else. The body always attempts to stay synchronized with what it believes to be reality. So if by mm. chance you had said 150,000 right off the bat and I went 150,000, well, again, my body is excited. And you need to know and learn how to control your gestures, your emotions. And it goes back to the question you posed a moment ago also about controlling oneself. You mm. need to understand, and that's part of the planning process. Sometimes you can, as a good negotiator, fake an emotion. Like, what? Seriously? And the other person goes, whoa, what the heck just happened? Oh, well, I had to sneeze, but no, you know. <laughs> yeah, I offended them. Now, now they may not want to talk to me anymore. And yeah, I get you. As we're kind of coming to the end of the show, I want to, I want to kind of wrap up all around the body language because I think that's so important. Um, I, I know there's some statistics out there and I don't have all of them in front of me, but, but generally speaking, my understanding of body language is that, you know, the, the body language is more powerful than the words that come out of somebody's mouth, right? And so if, if, you're, negoti if you're an employee negotiating a, a salary or a promotion or something like that, if you're an employer trying to partner with a vendor that, that they, you know, they need to connect with as a supplier for their goods and services, if you are selling a business or acquiring a business, like anytime you, you, you're in a negotiating um, situation, what are some, you know, quick takeaway tips on how to get your, your mind engaged on body language? Like what, are there some things you can do um, to, you know, I'm a very expressive person. So I use my hands and I, I elevate my voice and there's passion and there's energy. And, you know, that's just part of my, my personality. Um, I've learned to control that and, and to slow down sometimes if I'm talking to certain people that are, you know, more calm and cool and just very even keel, or if I'm talking to somebody that's, you know, more competitive, you know, a Donald Trump of the world or something, you know, quick to the point, direct, right? But how do you control your body language? I mean, because most people are just, I don't know, over time as they grow up, they, they just do what they do, right? And they only think about it. How do you, how can you do that? How, how can you set the stage for, for presenting the right body language at the right time? You just hit the nail on the head when you said they Did think. I? Okay. Yeah. Well, basically, a lot of people just do it. You know, no, 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 no. You think about what you're going to do. And thus, if you are in a negotiation and someone says something that's provocative, you know ahead of time, well, I can expect this individual to be provocative. And when they do, dependent upon whatever your strategy happens to be, I'm not going to display any emotions at all. Think about uh, people that play, I don't know. Um, well, I'm thinking of a card game. And uh, what's the first card game that comes to your mind that people play professionally? Poker. There you go. Poker. Now, what did I just do? I just solicited your assistance. When people help other people, most people feel good about the process. Now, mm -hmm. let me go back to the poker situation. You'll see some poker players wearing glasses. They know ahead of time, if I get a good hand, I don't want to submit or a um, submit a tell that will allow the other players to know that I have a good hand. So they have already prepared themselves ahead of time not to display certain gestures like, oh, <laughs> you know, one of those things. Right. They blink or they, their yes. eyes open. And yes, yes. I remember watching a James Bond. I can't remember which one it was. It's got Daniel Craig in. He's playing this high stakes mil millions and millions of dollars in poker with these terrorist kind of people and the guy would the the bad guy would like bleed out of his eye when he you know and 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 so james bond uh lost the first round with him and he had to go back in and then he eventually beat him in poker uh etc but but yeah there, there's telltale signs there well not not only that let's look at another aspect because people blink 15 to 20 times a minute when they get excited, their blink 
eye blinking rate increases. So that's yet something else you should be aware of because again, a good negotiator, especially one that has aspects about the value of body language, can even discern what's going on in your thought process by your blink rate. We emit so many different signals when we're in different environments per how comfortable we feel in that environment, how excited we are in that environment, how threatened we are in that environment. You've heard the, the old, and I, I'm going to say a myth, people crossing their arms means that uh, you know they are uh, not open or things that, of that nature. You may use that gesture in a negotiation to convey that sentiment and not really feel it at all. Hmm. So it's all about knowing what signals you want to send succinctly with the word choice you use and the body language that you actually exhibit. And yeah. that's how you win more negotiations. Now, is there a balance though, right? So in on one hand, you want to you wanna come in and maybe use some reverse psychology, right? Go in kind of defensive and cross your arms and just be serious and yeah, that, we'll think about that. Yeah, that's an interesting point. And you kind of be kind of stoic. And then, you know, later in the negotiations, you you turn the tables on them and then, you know, kind of play a different, you know, role, good cop, bad cop, or, you know, something like that, right? But is there a balance there? Because sometimes, you know, people, you know, you you start flipping around on them and 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 you know you're not you're not genuine. They're like, I don't know who I'm about to do a deal with here. I mean, this is Dr. Jekyll. Miss, like, so is there a balance there where you can like go overboard with that and cause more problems? There is always a balance in every yeah. negotiation because, like you said, you can go overboard. You don't want to confuse the other individual unless that's your intention. Well, I can give you A, B, C, D, E, F, or G. Tell me which one you want. Too many choices, okay? Yeah. Narrow the choices down. So you have to also be very much aware of what signals you're emitting via your body language. You're happy one moment, uh, sad the next. People go, is this person manic or what? You know? Uh, but again, and that all depends on the type of individual with whom you're negotiating. If you are negotiating with someone that's tough-minded, my way or the highway, again, you may want to display, exhibit the, well, I could be just as tough as you are and even tougher. Now, do you really want to go down this path? Hmm. Or somebody that goes along to get along? You know what? I know good and darn well we are going to have a good negotiation. I can just feel we're going to have a good negotiation. You feel it too? Yeah. You know, so, so again, you want to meet with what you're matched with, unless you want to just dominate to see what the other person will do, uh, and where that person wants to take the negotiation. And that all comes up, uh, as part of the whole planning process, how you're going to engage based on what they do, how you're going to alter your engagement, et cetera, et cetera. This is so fascinating. I think we can talk for another hour or two or, or even longer. I, there's all the dimensions here, all these dynamics. And we've, I feel like we've hit, you know, most of the wave tops here. I don't think we really peel back the onion, you know, and, and I wish sometimes I wish the show was three hours, you know, like a Joe Rogan show, right. Where you can really just deep dive into it. And so I, one, just thank you for your time today. Thank you for being on the show and sharing a lot of your great tips uh, you know, Greg, uh, just a, just an amazing person doing some wonderful things out there. You know, folks want to connect with you. They want to, you know, get it, get access to your books and read more detail and some of the tactics and, you know, your life lessons in this space. They want to, you know, connect with you, uh, work with you in some kind of form or fashion. What's the best way for them to get a hold of you? Well, you could do it in two different ways. You can send an email to Greg, that's G-R-E-G, -E at the, T-H-E, master, M-A-S-T-E-R, negotiator, N-E-G-O-T-I-A-T-O-R.com. And please, I love giving stuff away for free to help people throughout the world become better negotiators such that they improve the plight in their lives. Just go to the masternegotiator.com partake of tons of free stuff that I actually have there. And if you do so, you'll actually be helping me because you'll turn around and help other people become better negotiators. And remember, you're always negotiating.
Absolutely. And Greg, thank you for that. We're going to make sure we get all of that in the show notes as well. So no matter where they're listening to this, because it's it's all over the place, we've got social media covered. We've got all the different uh, podcast channels uh, covered here. We'll make sure all of that stuff's in those show notes to make it real easy for listeners to uh, to find you, engage with you. Highly, highly encourage you to read his, you know, seven books. Um, uh, fascinating work that can re- make a real tremendous impact in your life and in your career, help you go farther than you may be able to go on your own. And so thank you for your life's work into this. This is uh, amazing work, Greg. Um, uh, so that's it for today's show. However, you don't want to miss next week's show. If you think about where we are, folks, we're closing out the third quarter, going into the fourth quarter. This is the time where if you're a business leader, you, you need to be uh, you know checking the scoreboard on where you're at and what needs to happen to make sure you get where you need to be and end the year as strong as possible at the end of the fourth quarter coming up in just a few months. Next week, we're going to break that down and and go through how to, you know, simply go through an end of year review and start your planning process and adjustments so you end uh, where you want to end. So you don't want to miss that show. That's it. Have a great day, everybody. 